of the Jewish Cooking Connection, brought to you by the Jewish Federation of the Greater San Gabriel Pomona Valleys. I'm Jan Robertson from Temple Beth David in Temple City, and I'm going to show how to make your Shabbat challah. The ingredients we're going to use are powdered yeast. It really doesn't matter which kind as long as it has a good use-by date. Um, we use turmeric just a tiny bit for color. I like to put sesame seeds on top. Sugar. I use bread flour. It has a higher gluten content than all purpose flour does. Vegetable oil. Some people like to use olive oil, but I don't like the flavor, so I just use vegetable oil. We're going to use some eggs. And then in order to have the bread kind of creamy, we're gonna use potato water instead of milk. Okay, let's get started. So the recipe that I have today actually is gonna make four loaves. It freezes beautifully. So if you don't use it all, you just wrap it well, put it in the freezer, and the next time you're ready to serve it, let it thaw on the counter, and then you can just warm it in the microwave for a little, you know, till it smells good, and that's it. The first thing I did last night was I peeled and cut up two russet potatoes and covered them with two inches of water and boiled it for a half an hour. Why do we use potato water? And I'm gonna measure it to two and a half cups. So Friday night is usually a meat meal and so we can't, Laws of Kashrut are that um, we don't use dairy products when we serve a meat meal. So in order to get creaminess, we use the potato water because it, it's kind of starchy and it makes the bread kind of creamy. And then the next thing we're going to use is six egg yolks and six whole eggs. So let me show you how we the kosher way to crack an egg. Okay, so this is the way that I learned to separate an egg. It works very well, even though it does get your hands a little gooey. And then we're going to look at it and make sure that there's no blood spots. We're going to add it in here. Okay, so that was the yolk, and here we have five more, and here we have five whole eggs. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to add yeast to the potato water. Um, most of the yeast we're going to use today is, or today I mean in this year, century, uh, is already granulated. So there's the bread machine yeast, there's the active dry and the rapid rise. Um, rapid rise rises faster, but you get a richer flavor if you can wait longer and, and use the active dry. Now the active dry um, can't be more than 120 degrees when it's rising. Um, if you put water hotter than that, you'll kill it. Uh, the rapid rise can go to 130. Okay, so um, here I have the three tablespoons of yeast, which is, if you use the packets, it's four packets. Each packet is two and a quarter teaspoons. Okay, and so we add a little bit of our sugar. We have a cup and a half of sugar here, uh, something like a quarter of a cup in, into the yeast water. And the reason for that is the yeast will digest the sugar and then it will make bubbles of carbon dioxide or carbon something like that but anyway it's the bubbles that make your bread rise so when we see it start to bubble that's called proofing and they proof the yeast to make sure that it's good yeast however 
if you buy powdered yeast and it has a fresh date on it, it's going to work. You don't have to proof it. Okay, so the rest of the sugar I'm going to put into the eggs because if you beat the eggs with the sugar, that helps make it fluffy. And then after I get it nice and fluffy, I'm gonna add the other dry ingredients. I have an eighth of a teaspoon of turmeric. Oh, there's some turmeric, but there's the eighth of a teaspoon, it's just a tiny bit. Um, it improves the color of the bread, as well as turmeric is an anti-inflammatory, and I don't know that it has a taste at all. And then um, I'm using kosher salt, and so I have a tablespoon of salt, and I'm putting that in there too. Let me just make sure I have all the ingredients here. Flour, sugar, turmeric. Okay, and then some vegetable oil. I have a half a cup. So you see I'm getting all the liquid ingredients together. The yeast is already in there. Um, okay, and so now you can see the bubbles here. That lets you know that the yeast is alive. And then we originally got out um, 10 cups of bread flour, but I put seven to start with, and that's because how much flour you need depends on how hot a day it is, how dry it is, it just how much, flour is hydrophilic, meaning it loves water, and so um, the atmosphere will decide how much water it, it wants. So we may have to add water, um, we may have to add flour. So now all the ingredients for the challah are in here. And I start stirring it with a big spoon. Okay, so now I'm gonna use my hands to mix it up a little better. So now that it's kind of come together, I'm going to flour the counter, dump it out on the counter. Okay, so as you see all this, don't throw it away, it's food. Okay, so the flour will pick up whatever's been left in the bowl. Now, we're gonna knead it by bringing it towards us, pushing away with the heel of our hand. Bringing it towards us, pushing away with the heel of our hand, like this. Now, some recipes will tell you to knead for 10 minutes, but the way I learned it, because in a busy kitchen where you have everybody running around and calling for your attention, you can't be consistent about 10 minutes, so instead you count and you count 500. If your bread turns out kind of hard and flat, it's because you didn't knead it enough. Okay, so it's like one, two, three, four, five. You can see it starts to come together. Six, seven, eight, nine, 10. Okay, so you get the idea. And I do have a bench knife. There's one right here. You could also use a kitchen knife, but it really makes them dull. So, okay. So, when it's all kneaded and we've gotten to 500, it's gonna look like this. And now we need it to rise for something like an hour. We want it to be double in size. So we're gonna, that same bowl, we oil it. Thank you. 
And we're gonna put the oil all around the bowl. So we don't want the dough sticking to the bowl. And we're gonna put, we're gonna roll the dough around in the oil. Okay, now a lot of recipes will tell you just put a dish towel on top, but I don't like it when the dough sticks to the dish towel. So I either put a piece of saran wrap or a silicone mat, a lot of silicone mats, so I just put a silicone mat on top and then the dish towel. Okay, so it likes to um, have a warm place to rise. And so what I like to do, and Robin has done it for me, um, is heat water in the microwave, which she has done, and put that in the back of the oven. It also makes a little moisture steam, so that's good, keeps your bread moist. And then you just put that there, don't turn it on, to rise. Now it's about 50 minutes later, or 60 minutes later, and I'm, it's fully risen. So it's about doubled in bulk. And we're gonna take it out. Oops, I shouldn't, okay. I'm gonna take it out. And the recipe I gave you is gonna make four loaves, but this is only two because I've already used half of it. So I, I was taught to always cut the dough as opposed to tearing it because you're not supposed to tear the gluten. I'm not sure why, but. Okay, so there's, there's two ways to braid that I'm gonna show you. The first is simpler. I think the second is prettier. So the first uses four strands. This is the, the first method in it. It's very easy and it's good for people that are shy about braiding. You could also make a three strand braid, which is the same as when you do someone's hair. So if you can braid hair, you can do that. There's a reason for the six. In, in the temple of old, they had um, two stacks of show bread, each one was six. For, to represent the 12 tribes. So if you use six strands to make um, the hala, then you have six in one, six in the other equals the 12 tribes. So you don't have to do that, but you can. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna show you the, the easy way to make a four strand hala. So it's like weaving. So you have the outside one and it goes over and under and over. And then the next one, over and under and over. And then the next one, over and under. And then here, let's see, this one goes over, under. So that's pretty easy. And that looks kind of like a hala. And then I'm going to oil it a little bit with some of the oil from the from the pan that I used to rise the dough. In order to stretch, it needs to have some moisture, I mean some oil, so that when it pushes out, you know, it, it will give. So that's a four strand. And when it's fully risen, it'll be double that size. A six strand, which is what I prefer. A little more difficult, but not much. In temple days, the people brought hala to the Kohanim and that was the food that the Kohanim ate, and nobody was able to eat hala except the Kohanim. So today, we don't know who's a Kohan and who isn't. Um, 
So what we do is we separate a small piece of hala, um, like about a walnut size, like this, and we say a little blessing. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam. Blessed are you, um, God, uh, ruler of the universe, who has sanctified us by thy commandment, Asher Kedoshanu V'mitzvotav V'tzivanu, and commanded us to separate Hala, Lehafrish Hala. And then we say, this is Hala. So we take this Hala, and we burn it so that you can't eat it, and we discard it. So that's Hala. So, so this is a creature. Here's its head. It has two arms and four legs. Okay, so these are the arms, these are the legs. So first we cross the arms across the body. Head, upper arm, lower arm, and the legs are separated two and two. The first arm we use is the one closest to the head, and we bring it down between the legs. Now we're missing an arm, so we're gonna use this one for an arm, and we're gonna separate the legs two and two again. Then this is the higher arm, so it goes down the middle, and now we're missing an arm over here, so we're gonna bring this one across and separate the legs two and two again. Then this arm down the middle, replace it with this one. This arm down the middle, replace it with this one. This arm down the middle, replace it with this one. This arm down the middle, replace it with this one. When we get to the end, we just tuck the ends under. Okay, we're gonna set both of these loaves on a baking sheet. Oops. And we're gonna leave them again for, well, I'm gonna oil them first. We're gonna leave them again for 50 to 60 minutes and they will double in size one more time. And oil them so that they will grow. Oh, if you used raisins, you would have added them towards the end of the kneading time. Um, that's because you don't want to smash them. You do want them evenly distributed, but you don't want them smashed. Now, my mother uses the whole egg to glaze, but I don't because I like it shiny, so I just use the yolks. And all the extra egg whites, we can save them to make a spinach and egg white omelet. So a lot of people like to use a pastry brush, but I just kind of rub it on there like when you diaper a baby. Okay. And then I let it dry 10 minutes, which we're not gonna do because you don't wanna watch it dry. <laughs> and after 10 minutes, I dry it again. I mean, I egg wash it again. And that's when I turn on the oven. Actually, I should have turned the oven on before I started egg washing. Turn it on to 350. And then I'm gonna show you how I put the sesame seeds on. I don't do it the same way most people do. I need that flat dish. Okay, so only pour out as many as you're gonna use because once they've had raw egg on them, if you don't use them, you have to throw them away. Because, you know, raw egg becomes poison, so. Okay, so I like to put them on to where they follow the curve just because pretty. No other reason. I just think it looks better. So you could just shake them on there. That's what most people do, but I like to be artistic about it. Okay, 
So, this is the way it is when you put it into the oven. You might want to get off any spilled egg too. So it takes 30 to 35 minutes to bake. So you're gonna put it in the oven. Now, any oven, no matter how good an oven it is, is going to have hot spots. They just all do. And so, to make sure that you don't have like a corner burned and another part white, something like that, after 15 minutes, I set the timer for 15 minutes. After 15 minutes, I'll turn it around. If I'm using two racks, I'll first switch them top to bottom, bottom to top and then turn them around to make sure that it gets the same amount of heat all the way around. Okay, and so pretty much you can just look at it and know um, by the color. I tend to like my holla darker. Um, I like it to kind of have a color of polished mahogany. Okay, this is a thermometer, a food thermometer. It's actually for barbecuing. But I know that hala is done when it gets to 180. That means that there's no gooey dough inside. Um, so anyway, what I do, oh look, it cooked <laughs> so fast, is I use the digital thermometer. And by the way, you can get a digital thermometer on eBay for $5. I put it like right in the knuckle because it makes a little hole and you don't want the hole to be showing. About to the middle. And if it's at 180, it's cooked. But if it's still not dark enough, let's sit a little longer. Okay, and so this one's beautifully done. I let it sit on the sill pad or whatever parchment paper. Um, for about five minutes or so. And the reason is, if sometimes if you tear it off right away, you'll tear the bottom of the bread off. So let it sit for like five minutes, and then you can lift it off and place it on a cooling rack, okay? Don't cut the hala open until it's completely cool. The reason is you want the outside crisp, but you want the inside soft. And so you want, it's the steam that makes it soft. So you want to wait until all the steam has done its work. The outside has gotten crisp from the air and the inside is soft. Tobi me odot shepara 